Hello and welcome to the uh, part two of the lesson on communion. And I'd like to open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just ask a special blessing for those that's going to be viewing this lesson. I ask that you open their eyes so they can see your word. You open their ears so they can hear your word. You open their hearts so they can feel your word. And you open their minds so they can understand your word. Holy Spirit, I ask that you look through my eyes. You speak through my heart. And you touch through my, excuse me, you speak through my mouth. And you touch through my heart the lesson that you want to talk today. You bring forth a great harvest. But not my will, but your will be done. Amen. Okay, the lesson that the Holy Spirit is ministering on is communion. And what I would like to do is just pick up where I left off in uh, the first part. And what I was talking about, or what the Holy Spirit was talking about, was in John's account of the Last Supper, uh, John did not mention the Last Supper at all. He mentioned how Jesus uh, took on the form of a servant. And that's what the Holy Spirit is ministering on now. Okay, and we're talking about uh, being a servant like Jesus was. We have to run the race with joy, pacing ourselves so that we will be able to finish and then receive a full reward for our labors. Many servants of God have gone to distant lands and were desp despised by the people whom they were sent to serve. In China, the foreigners are called foreign devils. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. A lot of us are going through a lot of trials and tribulations because we're trying to hold on to those burdens ourselves. Here the Lord is giving us a way out. He's telling us to put the burden on him. Why? Because he's able to bear it. A lot of us put the burden on the Lord or say we cast it out to the Lord. And if we haven't received what we wanted to receive within eight seconds, then we want to take it back. No, the Lord tells us to cast it on him. And if we truly believe and trust in the Lord, we'll give it to him. Because remember, it says that... Um, the trials and tribulations of today is enough for today. So if you give it to them, <laughs> it's most, most likely you're going to have another trial and tribulation tomorrow to give that to them also. So let's stop trying to hold on to the burden ourselves and give it to the Lord. See, we'll, we'll, we will cast it out to him, which is a fishing term. And in another fishing turn, we'll just turn around and reel it back in until we can't deal with it. And we'll cast it back out again. No, the Lord wants you to cast it out and leave it for him to deal with or for him to handle. Amen. Things around us can really can be really bad sometimes. But when we are next to the Lord, then he will give us the grace and the strength to go on. When we are weak, then we are strong. Because we draw from the resources, knowing that I can do all things through Christ, who strengthens me, Philippians 4.13. As the Apostle Paul affirmed, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. And that's in Colossians 1.29. When Jesus the servant was on earth, he did not line up with the common view of what the Messiah or the kings of the Jews should be like. Jesus did not overthrow the Roman Empire and set his nation free. Yet he did something far more important than that. He conquered sin and defeated death. Success for serving Jesus was to fulfill his mission in his allotted time frame here on earth to obey the Father and to serve mankind by being the sacrificial Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we see that in John 1.29. Jesus said, Whosoever desires to be great among you, you shall be, or he shall be your servant. And whosoever of you desire to be first, shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to serve. Did, excuse me. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Mark 10, 43, 45. In other words, no one could have killed Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was God. That's why Jesus said he gave his life up. In other words, if Jesus didn't give his life up, you, uh, he would not be able to be crucified and 
we would not be able to be entered or have access into the presence of the Father. Amen. If you desire to be a real servant of God, then you would need to follow the Master's footsteps by obeying him and delighting to do his will. Jesus in John 13, 1 through 17, washed the disciples' feet. This was a great act of love and humility. Even though he was their teacher, he was prepared to humble himself and do the most menial of tasks. Jesus said, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done for you. A servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. The moral of this story is that if you want to get to the top in God's eye, then you have to start at the bottom. Without forgetting where you come from, if you ever reach the top, be humble enough to act when the need arises if you are still at the bottom. Always treat people with the greatest respect and dignity. Remember, whatever you do for the least of these, you do also unto God himself, who will richly reveal all those who have followed faithfully, excuse me, who will richly reward all those who have followed faithfully along the way and who have completed the race with joy in his, in his strength. And here are a couple of scriptures that help me uh, being humble and being a servant. The first one is found in 1 Corinthians 3, 7. It says then, it says, so then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God giveth the increase. In other words, if you're doing something and you don't see the manifestation of what you're doing, remember, it's not on you, it's on the Father, amen? And in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink, or whether you do, do it all to the glory of God. And that scripture, it helps me because it's letting me know whatever you're doing, you do it all to the glory of God. And it's funny, you know, I'm ministering on communion, and it says whether you eat or drink. And remember at the Last Supper, the, Jesus said, this is my body, that the bread is his body, and the, uh, the cup was his blood. And it says here, whether you eat or drink, do it all to the glory of God. And that's what Jesus did. He did it all to the glory of God. And not only that, one of the main reasons why Jesus came to us or for us was to show us the Father or to lead us to the Father. And now I'd like to talk about communion. And this is the meaning of communion. This do in remembrance of me. With these words ringing in our ears, we regularly regularly celebrate communion. As we drink the cup and eat the bread, we reflect on Christ's sacrifice and look forward to his return. Yet communion is more than a memorial. Our continued participation in this powerfully symbolic ceremony molds our thinking and bring to life deeply spiritual truth in very concrete ways. It shapes our identity as a people of God and provides the truly blessed assurance that we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The message of communion is important and deserves our full attention. An unworthy manner. From what we have said, it follows that believers should share communion at every reasonable opportunity. Yet often believers abstain from sharing in this rich experience. They allow the bread and cup to pass by them by as they sit in guilt and shame, wishing they were worthy. There was a time when I myself would have stayed if I was struggling with some <coughs> sin. What it is that drives believers from their Lord's table is these spiritual imitate, intimate moments. This practice stems from Paul, Paul's warning in 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 32. Where Paul tells us to examine ourselves before communion. For whosoever eat the bread or drink the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Participating in an unworthy, an unworthy manner brings judgment. 
and none of us wishes to transcript this command. Therefore, we examine ourselves before participating, seeing how well we measure up. If we feel spiritual enough, we may proceed. If we don't, better safe than sorry. But if you think about it, the Lord, when he was on that cross, he died for all our sins. So if we think we're not unworthy, then we're focusing on ourselves and not focusing on what the Lord has done for us. And that's one of the trick of the enemies to always have us focus on ourselves. Because if we focus on ourselves, guess what? We're not worthy. But if we focus on the Lord, we are worthy. And that's what the message of grace is all about. Because the, our definition of grace is receiving what we don't deserve. Remember, it should have been us on that cross. Amen. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of, my, of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whosoever eat my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at that last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whosoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Consider further the fact that Jesus' blood cleanse us from sin. When we are guilty, that is when we need Jesus the most. When we are struggling, that is when we need the help and support of the body. We need to be reminded that we are in a fellowship of brothers and sisters who represent Jesus to us, and we need the strength and assurance provided by the communion celebration. To shrink away from it is to retreat within ourselves and suffer silently. What then did Paul mean in 1 Corinthians? Consider the text. The Corinthians believers were abusing the Lord's Supper. When you come together, is it not the Lord's Supper you eat? For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for another, for anyone else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. This was talking about the unworthy manner. Some of the people, they were coming just to eat the food, you know, not uh, taking in consideration the Lord. Some of them, they were coming drunk. Some of them, they were um, stepping over people to get, you know, to the front of the line. And they didn't care about those that didn't have anything to eat of all. In other words, they were coming from selfish motives. The Corinthians believer contradicted the whole point of communion experience. Rather than celebrating their unity, they were revealing their divisions. Hence, Paul questioned, do you despise the church of God? They were eating and drinking without recognizing the body of the Lord. This is the body of Christ, of which they were part. As such, they were eating and drinking in an unworthy manner and bringing judgment on themselves. The unworthy manner relates to the way they abuse the Lord's Supper. This observation is confirmed by verses 33 and 34. So then, my brother, uh, talking about um, 1 Corinthians 11, 33 and 34. So then, my brother, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home, so that when you eat together, it may not be judgment or result in judgment. When we struggle with sin and find ourselves in need of forgiveness, let us seek that forgiveness and eagerly reach for the cleansing blood of Christ. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which he gives thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And that's found in 1 Corinthians 10, 16. Let us share the communion experience and the assurance that we are part of God's people. Is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? And that's in 1 Corinthians 10, 16. The message of communion is one of hope and comfort, but is also one of warning. Paul directs our attention to the body and asks us to examine ourselves. Are we communion, communing as a body? Right relationship with the body are essential. Jesus taught that this aspect of church life is to take precedence over worship. And we see that in Matthew 25, excuse me, Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Communion is not an individual matter. It is a body matter. We commune as a body. We come to the Lord's table as a family. 
This truth is bound up in the, in the biblical symbol of the one loaf of bread and the one cup. Because there is one loaf, Paul writes, and who, we who are many are one body, for we partake of the one loaf. And we see that in 1 Corinthians 10:17. The New Testament Christian celebrates communion by sharing a single cup and a single loaf of bread as visual signs of their unity. In this, they follow the patterns of Jesus and his disciple at the Last Supper. Without this symbol, it is easy to forget the communal nature of this important ceremony. Another key ingredient in the early church communion experience was the shared meal in which context the loaf and the cup were shared. The Lord's Supper was made up of both potluck and the emblems as the context of 1 Corinthians. And this too, the Lord's Supper reflected the Last Supper. What Paul describes here as the Lord's Supper is described by Peter and Jude as agape or love fest. This meal was the vocal point of the church's weekly experience as Acts 27 indicates. And before I get to final lesson, um, I know one of the question is who can participate and communion. Everyone can participate in communion. If you think about in that communion or that last supper, Jesus even allowed uh, Judas to participate in the communion knowing that he was about to portray him. So, you know, you have some churches that say that you have to be saved to participate in communion. You have to be a member of the body of Christ or you have to be a member of that church to participate. No, anyone can participate. Not only that, if you see someone participating in communion, you know you're not a member of that church, that's an opportunity for you to go minister salvation to them or to ask them have they received the Lord as their Lord and Savior or explain what they just participate when they partook of communion. Amen. The only passage, the only other passage in 1 Corinthians in which Paul uses this language is in uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 14, 26, where, as everyone recognized, Paul is explicitly describing the church regular assembly. From this, is, it appears the early church commune every single week, not monthly, quarterly, or annually, as many churches do today. The body dimensions of communion tells us something about the mood of the meal as well. Communion is often taken in a somber mood of dismal introspective as we focus on the death of Christ. But could the proper context be one of celebration? If a shared meal were part of our communion together, it would seem so. We read in Acts that the first communion, excuse me, that the first Christians broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. And we see that in Acts 2.46. Communion was an occasion of sharing with the saints and celebrating the forgiveness found in Christ. And this, the communion meal, was intended as a foreshadowing of the Masonic banquet feast described in Isaiah 25.6. Until he comes. One of the things that we're supposed to remember when we're having our partaking of communion is that the Lord wants us to sit at his table and serve us. Amen. This forward-looking aspect is confirmed not only by 1 Corinthians 11:26 until he comes, but also the account of the Last Supper in Luke 22, 16, 18, and 29. The next time your church celebrates communion, take a look around the room and consider the brothers and sisters with whom you are communing with. Evaluate your relationships with each and every one of them. Do you despise the church of God? question that Paul asked. Consider how to put an end to the unresolved conflicts you may have with a member of the body of Christ. Do you recognize the body of the Lord? If so, commune with thanksgiving. Are you struggling with sin? Drink deeply of the cup of forgiveness and thank God that Christ is coming soon to usher us in to the banquet hall where we shall celebrate with all the saints in the body. The Last Supper. The Last Supper is one of several events in the earthly life of Jesus Christ that are recorded in the Bible. The Last Supper is a description of the last meal Jesus had with his disciples prior to his arrest and crucifixion on a Roman cross 
over 2,000 years ago. The Last Supper contains many significant principles and continues to be an important part of Christian life throughout the world. The Significance of the Last Supper The Last Supper is described in three of the four Testament Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Here are some of the life-changing highlights as recorded in the Gospel of Luke. First, Jesus predicts he will suffer soon after this meal, and it will be his last meal prior to finishing his work on behalf of the kingdom of God. And we see that in Luke 22, 15 through 16. Second, Jesus gives his followers symbols of remembrance for his body and his blood, sacrifice on behalf of all mankind. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given to you. Do it in remembrance of me. And that's in Luke 22, 19. Third, Jesus provides a very important principle for living a Christian life. The greatest are those who serve others, not those who expect to be served. And we see that in Luke 22, 26. Finally, Jesus provides hope to his followers. And I confer on you a kingdom just as my Father conferred on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And that's found in Luke 22, 29 through 30. For the last two millenniums, the Last Supper has inspired people to live by faith in Jesus Christ, by serving others instead of following the worldly influences of expecting to be served. The Last Supper was held on the evening of preparation for the Jewish Passover, a very holy time for the Jewish nation and the remembrance of when God spared the Jews from the plague of the death of the firstborn of their child in Egypt. Jesus arranged the dinner purposely by instructing his disciples where to host it. His twelve disciples were with him during and after the meal. It is here that Jesus makes the prediction that Peter will deny knowing him three times before the rooster crows that morning, which became true. Jesus also predicts that one disciple, Judas Iscariot, will betray him, which also became true. The Last Supper was a gathering for Christ to fellowship with his disciples one last time prior to his arrest and his crucifixion. After the Last Supper, Jesus Christ willfully and obedient allowed himself to be brutally sacrificed on a wooden cross. He did this to reconcile each of us to God by paying a debt for our sin, which we could never do on our own power. In return, Jesus made a simple request. Remember this act of love he performed on our behalf. Jesus Christ did not have to die for us. He did, however, because he values every life on earth and wants to see each and every one of us sitting at his dining table sometime or someday in heaven. Throughout the Bible and throughout history, the truth of Christ's message has been established. That we can join Jesus in heaven by acknowledging his sacrifice and accepting him into our life. In addition, we can apply the lessons Jesus taught at the Last Supper to live a faithful life we're here on earth by serving others in love. The bread is a symbol of the body of Jesus, never to be forgotten as it was given to us. The cup represents the blood of Jesus, never to, never to be forgotten as he poured out his life for us. Jesus Christ has offered everybody the gift of his life, death and resurrection. The Last Supper, the last supper reminds us of Christ's sacrifice and that by faith, in him, we can dine with Christ for all eternity. Now I'd like to um, ask, them, or ask and answer some questions that you may have about communion. You may be confused about what many churches call Holy Communion. Why is there so much discrepancy in how different churches do it? Some use bread, others use wafers, some use wine, others use grape juice. Some do it daily, others do it weekly or yearly. What does the Bible say about taking com Holy Communion and the communion service? I'm so glad you asked because this is one of my favorite subjects, mainly because it is so practical. You'll see what I mean by the time I answer this too infrequently asked question. As usual in these 
facts or answers and questions, my relatively brief answer is elaborated upon as we get more into the lesson. It seems that why the ceremony was with bread and wine is called Holy Communion comes from 1 Corinthians 10, 16. The cup of the blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? Asking a question. The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? That's another question. The Greek word communion is translated koinonoia. Uh, it's spelled K-O-I-N-O-N-I-A. And it means a full sharing. In English, we could see that the word communion denotes union with oneness. And that is most significant as we will see. First of all, no matter what elements the church uses or how often they do it, or what they call it, the commonality is that the participant eats and drinks something. Let us follow this in scripture. Beginning in Matthew 4, where Jesus being tempted by the devil, Jesus had not eaten for 40 days, and the devil tempted him in turn to turn stones into bread. Jesus replied, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. There is a biblical metaphor that compares believing the word of God with eating. Think about it. To take into your mind the written word of God to the end that you act upon it is similar to taking into your body food and drink. There are many examples of this figurative analogy in scripture such as taste and see that the Lord is good, Psalms 34, 8. My people has forsaken me, the spring of living water, Jeremiah 21, 3. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work, John 4, 34. And the one we look at in more detail is, I am the bread of life. And that's in John 6, 35. Now let's talk about what it is to eat or drink. Picture it. You and I, you had a candy bar or tofu or a bag of chips or whatever. And what are your options? Walk away and receive neither the benefits nor the consequences of ingesting and digesting it. Or put it in your mouth, chew it, spit it out, again, not receiving the good or the bad from it. Or number three, chew and swallow it, receiving either the benefits or the consequences of its ingredients. Which of, three, which of these three would you say is making a total commitment to the item? Number three, stomach pumps aside. When you swallow something, you are one with it from then on. Who invented eating and drinking? God did. Do you enjoy eating and drinking? Did God make any delicious stuff to eat and drink? Ribeye steak, ice cream, hot dog, pancakes, waffles. I can go on and on, but you know, everyone has something special that they like to eat. What happens if you do not eat or drink? You die or you expire. Have you noticed that most folks eat? Most folks get that and do anything it takes to get food and water. Many prisoners of war have reported eating bugs, snakes, shrink rat airline food just to stay alive. Now then, if God had made all food we need to eat in order to survive, we eat it anyway, right? Sure, because the alternative is death. And just like we have to have natural food every day to stay alive, guess what? We need spiritual food every day to stay alive. And we don't just eat natural food once a day. Well, if we can afford it, we try to eat more than once a day. Guess what? You need to eat spiritual food more than once a day too. Amen? Because if you don't, the alternative, if you don't have that physical food, the alternative is death. And we are programmed to stay alive. How awesome of God to make that which we absolutely must do in order to stay alive the things we love to do. Do you think that that last statement has any relevance to spiritual matters? Sure it does. Believing the word of God is absolutely necessary to get born again and have everlasting life. And believing and obeying it is absolutely necessary for our lives today and for the rewards that we will receive when the Lord Jesus appears. 
And walking with God and the Lord is delicious. There is nothing more satisfying than obeying God and seeing him keep his promises to us. Okay, back to the Bible. In John 6, in verses 1 through 15, here's what happened. Jesus came upon a company picnic where everyone forgot to bring lunch. Taking advantage of this opportunity to give his, his disciples a pop quiz, he asked them what they could do to feed the crowd that was estimated at 5,000 men. They flunked, saying, no way. Someone did have five small fishes and some bread, excuse me, Smart five small loaves of bread and two fishes. Jesus told his disciples to have the people sit down, took the bread and the fish, and gave thanks to God, and passed out the fish sandwiches so everyone, as many as they wanted, could take some doggy bags home. All-you-could-eat buffet. Have you ever seen those words on a sign or banner outside a restaurant? Have those words ever motivated you to turn your steering wheel and go there? Personally, I love those words. And I'm heartbroken to say that when I go to eat all you can eat, it's usually only a plate. Because we try to put more on our plate than we can get because our nature is to try to get it all before it's gone. But you know what? God's word is not like that. You can have all you can eat, all you can digest, and when you spiritually belch, you can eat some more. Amen? What if you had been in that crowd that Jesus fed? Did you not get all that they could eat of that delicious free food? And that is why when they realized that the source of their sustenance had apparently gone on the other side of the lake, they got into the boat and they went to find him. We see that in John 6, 24. When they did, Jesus said to them, I know you're looking for me, not because you recognize the miracle, I did be because you want some more of that delicious food, all you can eat. And then as often as he often did, Jesus took advantage of concrete physical situations to teach spiritual truth. He said, don't work only to get food for your physical lives, but work for the food that gives you everlasting life. They said, what is that? He said, that work is to believe on me as the one God sent. Now get this, in verse 30, they ask, What miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? And in verse 31, like manna in the desert our forefathers got. Talk about self-restraint. How could Jesus possibly not have replied with something like, Excuse me, aren't you the same people who are at the picnic? Where do you think those fish and sandwiches came from? But he said, in essence, the manna Moses gave was pointing to me. I am the true bread from God. The crowd still thought he was talking about physical food and replied, okay, we'll take some. It's like in John 14, when um, the disciples were asking to, for Jesus to uh, reveal the Father to them. Jesus said, have I not been with you so long? If you've seen the Father, you have seen me. Guess what? In our lives, a lot of times, the only God that the people are going to see is going to be you. So you want to make sure that you prayed up, that you stayed up, that you're walking in the Lord, because a lot of times, people are watching you whether you know it or not. And you don't want to be a hypocrite telling them that you shouldn't drink, and they always see you on a corner or at the liquor store getting you something to drink or you shouldn't smoke and they see you smoking, you want your life to be an open epistle. In other words, you want your life to be reflected and manifested in the life of Jesus. Amen? And in verse 35, Jesus clearly draws a similar analogy to what we saw in Matthew 4.4. 4. He said, I am the bread of life, talking about John uh, 6.35, who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Shortly thereafter, in verses 51 through 58, he reiterates that he is the bread from God, and that whoever eats his flesh and drinks his blood will one day have everlasting life. 
Don't we today still use similar figures of speech? Absolutely. What might you say to describe a listener, a rap attention to a speech? He's really drinking it in, or he's eating it up. We use those figures because of what eating and drinking are all about. For example, it's not eating if you miss your mouth with the ice cream cone and stick it in your forehead. Likewise, is it not eating it up if the listener is looking out the window, mumbling to himself? The key is taking something into oneself. Were the disciples who were with Jesus at the picnic the same ones who were there when he came to the Last Supper? Yes. Did they understand the analogy between eating and drinking and believe the words of Jesus? Yes. And in keeping with this metaphor, what did Jesus say when he took first the bread? This bread metaphorically represents my body, given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Do what? Eat. And the cup, drink in remembrance of me. The question to ask now is whether or not at the Last Supper, Jesus was instituting a ritualistic ceremony for his followers to observe. If so, it is strange that he gives us no guidelines and neglected to tell us how often to do this. A study on the first century church shows that one of the participants that followed was of having the love fest. They gathered to other believers' house and they served several purposes. Chief among this was fellowship. What a joy it is to eat good food with good friends, especially when you are not in a hurry. These joyous meal times were also an occasion for believers to eat and drink and thereby remember what Jesus accomplished for them by his death and more importantly, his resurrection. Furthermore, the love first served as a kind of welfare program for those Christians who were poor. Those who could not bring more food did so. Those who could bring more food did so, and that helped those who had none to eat it all. And that is the context of 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 34. A section that, that often has been misunderstood. Remember that the first epistle to the Corinthians is filled with reproof for many of their spiritual male practices. And the last half of the chapter 11 focuses on the distortion of the Lord's Supper. Verses 20 through 22 says specifically addresses their selfishness, gluttonous, and drunkenness as their gathering. Verses 23 to 26 reiterates that Jesus said, at his last supper, and that's uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 23-26. Uh, what Jesus said, the last supper with his disciples, and it is well worth noting that in verse 25, that the Greek text reads, do this whenever you drink in remembrance of me. The unworthy manner in verse 27 refers back to the malpractices of verses 22-22. through 22. And in verse 29, the body of the Lord refers to the church. The believers, almost unbelievable, in verse 30 shows that the gluttony and the withholding from some of the weak and poor had become so rampant that some of the believers actually died, apparently from malnutrition. Paul exerts the Corinthians to exercise eternal discipline in these matters and closes the chapter by saying that if people cannot have properly have be, if people cannot behave properly at the love fest they should stay at home and given his instructions at the last supper did Jesus really envision a daily weekly monthly or yearly ceremony of wafers and grape juice i don't think so i think that he was encouraging his followers to remember him whenever they ate or drank in that culture, bread and wine were two primary staples, and thus he chooses them as the food and drink. For the record, it is certainly not a sin to participate in communion ceremony. In fact, it can be very meaningful, but let's think about how practical it is to remember the Lord and what he did, is doing, and will do for us every time we eat and drink. And another thing I want to emphasize before I forget is that you don't have to go to a um, church ceremony to have communion. You could have communion in your house anytime you want to. You don't have to make it a tradition. 
And like it just said, you want to do it or you want to have remembrance of what the Lord did for you every time you eat and every time you drink. As Christians, our goal is to practice the presence of the Lord Jesus in our lives, making him a part of whatever we do. On the other hand, Satan goes to is in the rat race of life, is to steal our thoughts of God and Christ. Quiet prayer and Bible reading times are essential, but it's not always available to do that for hours in a day. Too often it seems life consumes us. I don't know about you, but my mind has been distracted from the things of God way too many times in my life. But has anything ever stolen my thoughts about food? Are you kidding? I take my last bite of breakfast and I'm already thinking about what's for lunch. How much of our daily thought time and our activities revolve around eating and drinking a lot? If you think about it, a lot of times when you're in church and if you haven't had breakfast, you're looking at the clock saying, well, as soon as this is over, what, you want, what you're going to eat for lunch, are you already planning your meal for lunch and dinner while you're in church? That's how prominent the thought of food is in our life. Many Christians do pause to give thanks before they eat a meal, and that is a pause that refreshes. But what if they, what if the proven principle of mental association, we make it a habit to think and to thank the Lord whenever we eat a candy bar, or at a highway rest stop to get something to eat, or stop at the office drinking water fountain? Do you think that in a split second you focus on him he might give you a thought from the throne. Some insight you need at that moment. There's certainly more chance of that happening than if you're not thinking about him, right? And how about edifying? It is to dwell upon the love Jesus showed for each of us by going to the cross and laying down his life for us. How wonderful to remember amidst the din of life and all the pressures that we each belong to the Lord as a vital part of his body that he is coming for us and that in the meantime he is our life and is right there to help us become like him in this dying world. What a joy it is or a joy it can become to dig in to the life-giving word of God and to savor its nourishment. Doing so will remind us that we can always make a total commitment to the word by chewing, swallowing, and digesting it to the end that it sustains us. Food for thought, huh? Communion is a beautiful, symbolic act that Jesus instructs his followers to do in remembrance of him. The communion table is a representative of the Last Supper during which Jesus taught his disciples about what, was about what he was about to do by giving his body and blood to save the world from sin. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given to you, for this is the remembrance. Do this in remembrance of me. Many denominations continue the practice with symbolic elements, like grape juice and crackers or bread. It is often used as an introspect time of remembrance of Christ's work on the cross and our personal need for a Savior. It's a wonderful thing to remember Jesus in that way. Though that time of humble remembrance should not start at the end of the communion table. An incorrect teaching in some of the large denominations is that the elements, the wine and the bread, actually becomes the real body and blood of Jesus Christ upon consumption. This uh, thinking originated from the above-mentioned scripture in which Jesus said, This is my body. Body. Clearly, since Jesus was still alive and actually in the room, he was speaking symbolically. Furthermore, there is no reason for God to have believers consuming the actual body and blood of his son. The act of taking communion, while intimate and precious, must be taken symbolically, just as Jesus himself presented it to his disciples. Now question, what is communion and why do Christians observe communion? Unlike baptism, which is a one-time event, communion is a, is a practice that is meant to be observed over and over throughout the life of a Christian. It is the holy time, it is a holy time of worship when we corporately come together as one body to remember and celebrate the Christ, what Christ did for us. In observing communion, we are remembering Christ and all that he has done for us, his life, 
his death, and his resurrection. When observing communion, we take time to examine ourselves. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. And that's in 1 Corinthians 11, 22, excuse me, 28. In observing communion, we are proclaiming his death until he comes. It is then a statement of faith. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. When we observe communion, we show our participation in the body of Christ. His life becomes our food and we become members of each other. It is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks and participation in the blood of Christ? Question. And is not the bread that we eat and break participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we are many, are one body. For we partake of the one loaf. And we see that in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, 17. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat it. This is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it all. Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sin. On the last day of the festival of unleavened bread, or the Passover, Jesus sent two of his disciples ahead with a very specific instruction on where to prepare the Passover meal. That evening, Jesus sat down at the table with his 12 disciples to eat this final meal before going to the cross. And they dined together. He told the 12 that one of them would soon betray him. One by one, they questioned, Is it I, Lord? Jesus explained that even though he knew he would die as the scriptures foretold, his betrayal of faith would be terrible, far better for him if he had never been born. Then Jesus took the bread and the wine and he asked his father to bless it. He broke the bread to pieces, giving it to his disciples and said, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This wine is the token of God's new covenant to save you, an agreement sealed with blood. I will pour out for you. He told all of them, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Then they sang hymns and went on to Mount of Olives. The Passover commemorated Israel's escape from bondage in Israel, excuse me, in Egypt. In Exodus, the blood of the Passover lamb was painted on the door frames, causing the plague of the firstborn to pass over their homes, sparing the firstborn sons from death. The Last Supper was very significant because Jesus showed his disciple he was about to become the Passover lamb of God. His blood would open the door to freedom. His followers would exchange slavery to sin and death for eternal life in God's kingdom. Typically, wine is served four times during a Passover meal. According to the Jewish tradition, the four cups represent four expressions of redemption. The first cup is called the cup of sanctification. The second is called the cup of judgment. The third is the cup of redemption. And the fourth is the cup of the kingdom. The Last Supper each questioned Jesus. Could I be the one to betray you? I will guess at that moment they were also questioning their own heart. A little while later, Jesus predicted Jesus' threefold denial. Are there times in our walk of faith when we should stop and question? How true is my commitment to the Lord? Do I profess to love and follow Christ, yet deny Him with my action? The first thing to say is that the Last Supper story must be seen in the context of Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom of God. Because this was so central in his ministry, we must interpret the the supper in a way that fits in with Jesus' proclamation that the kingdom of God had come near. What did he mean by this proclamation? To To put it very simply, he meant that the day of God's salvation, which the old Testament promise and which his contemporaries were longing for had dawned. First century Palestine was of course an occupied country 
The Roman imperialists had been in control of the country for almost a hundred years. And although the Romans were relatively benign rulers, the high taxation and their subject had to pay was a great burden on a very poor country. And it was in any case extremely irksome to have to live under a culturally and religiously alien superpower. Jesus' announcement of God's new day, the day of God's rule, was good news. Jesus explained that God's marvelous Old Testament promise to his people were being fulfilled in his ministry. And we see that in Luke 18, four, Luke 4, 18 and 21. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled and he demonstrated the truth of his claim and actions in Mark 11, 2 through 6. Excuse me, Matthew 11, 2 through 6. He healed the sick. He welcomed sinners back to God. He broke through social barriers. For example, the barriers between the Jews and the Samaritans. He changed selfish people like Zacchaeus into generous people. He was visibly overcoming that strong man, Satan, and restoring the rule or kingdom of God. He did not bring the kingdom all at once to the, dis to the uh, disappointment of his disciples, but he saw himself as starting the process, like a sower sowing his seed that would produce the harvest. In the broad context of the Last Supper was Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom of God. No more particular context was his last journey up to Jerusalem. Jesus had come to Galilee with his disciples to the holy city in order to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. The journey was, as Jesus made clear, and as his disciples recognized, one of particular significance. We read that Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem and his disciples recognized that there was something special about his journey. They knew that something momentous was about to happen to Jerusalem according to Luke 19.11 and they hoped that Jesus was now going to complete that revolution that he had begun. And remember at the beginning of the first lesson I talked about how the uh, children of Israel were supposed to take a lamb without blemish well, guess what? In the New Testament, Jesus is our lamb without blemish, without any stain, without any guilt, without any condemnation. And he did what he did. He went to the cross so that we could not have to show us that we no longer have any guilt, any shame, any condemnation. Remember, if you are in the body of Christ, there is no condemnation. In other words, when the father looks at you, he sees his son, Jesus, and no one can bring charge against you. Guess what? You can't even bring charge against your own self because God sees you as he sees Jesus, as righteous, as, as a, full of joy, full of peace, full of everything that the father has. And remember, in the word it says, you are as you see Jesus. So when you look at Jesus and see him healed, see him whole, See him full of grace, see him full of mercy, that you're supposed to see yourself the same way. And if you don't see yourself the same way, guess what? You're looking at yourself and you're not looking at the Father. Amen? And in closing, I just want to remind everyone that there's a, a one-page paper that is due. And that paper should tell, or should tell us what you have learned so far and what you plan to do and what you have learned. And in closing, I just want to remind everyone, regardless of what you have done in the past, what you are doing in the present, or what you will do in the future, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Actually, if you are in the midst of doing it right now, confess, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And if no one has ever told you that they love you, guess what? God loves you, and we love you too. And until we meet again, God bless you. Amen.